ways are so far above our ways as the heavens are above the earth. The synthesis of the gospel is Jesus himself at the end, forever. You and I will be in heaven or hell, period. In recent years, we have certainly had lots of homilies, sermons, uh, books, dissertations about love. Uh, most of them uh, were probably inoffensive not necessarily bad, but not necessarily very effective either. In the end, love equals sacrifice, and sacrifice equals love. Now, it takes a certain amount of wisdom to understand that. And usually, wisdom comes with age. You know, when we're younger, we don't usually have as much wisdom as we're, when we're older. That's because we haven't made all the mistakes yet. Very often through life, you know, we make the mistakes, we learn from them, and we acquire wisdom. Now, wisdom is, of course, one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So a young person can have wisdom. It's a gift of the Holy Spirit. I know a lot of young people who are very wise and wiser than some old people. Just because you're old doesn't mean you're wise. There's no fool like an old fool. <laughs> remember, remember that uh, saying, and we can all be guilty of it at one time or another. I know I am now and then. I'm constantly, I think it's my grandmother's voice, periodically comes back to haunt me. All those old sayings I learned from her because she, she knew them all. It was part of her... That was just part of her heritage, I guess, from the time that she lived in. And she would repeat them often and at, you know, key points exactly when I needed to hear them. No fool like an old fool. Well, that, that's true. You, you know, you've, you've had time to learn. Uh, hopefully we have. Love. Great mystery. In talking about the Catholic family, obviously you have to talk about love. Uh, the Catholic family certainly is a garden of holiness. Therefore, it has to be a garden of virtue. It has to be a garden of life. It has to be a garden of love. That's where love is manifested, exchanged, safeguarded, nurtured, brought to fruition in the family. That's what we're called to do in the family, to safeguard and manifest love. It is extremely important to have some idea of definition. Words are important, you know. I, I, I've talked about that in the last few hours, how be careful about the wordsmiths, about what they say. Don't be um, deceived by uh, clever wording. I could call it um, serpentine semantics. Hmm? Uh, be careful. Be careful about uh, the misuse of language. Love. You know, terms like free love. Um, love. You know, we use that word so many different ways. You know, uh, we only have one word in English. Love. Uh, but you look how all the ways that we use it. I love northern Michigan. I love hot dogs at the ball game. I love my dog, Sage and Delta. I love my sister. I love my friends. I love God. One word, but very different gradations of meaning. 
I don't love God the same way I love an Oscar Mayer hot dog. You know? But it's the same word. Hmm? And, and we talk about free love, making love. And very often the terms are misused. They're distorted. They lose their meaning. And so you've got to come back to a redefinition of terms, an authentic definition of terms. Now, in the New Testament, which is where we get most of Christianity from, there were three words used in Koine Greek for love, basically. An argument that there were four, really, but three for the most part. And they indicate different things completely. Uh, one indicated uh, sexual or romantic love. Another indicated brotherly love. And yet another indicated that highest form of love, which is what Christian love really is. What's the word? You know the word. Agape love. Yeah. That's the Greek word that indicates or that is used for Christian love. That's the kind of love that we're really talking about when we talk about love in the church or love in marriage. Now, all those other forms of love are good. You know, they're, 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 they can be uh, dimensions of a higher love. How can you really know what authentic love is? Well, we learn things from God. If you want to know about the truth, you have to look at the one who is the truth. How do you know about God? They said to Jesus, Lord, show us the Father, and that'll be enough. And Jesus said, have I been with you this long and you still don't get it? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. You want to know about God's love? You want to know about God? You've got to look at Jesus Christ. Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. No one goes to the Father except through the Son. The love of Christ. Sacrificial love. God so loved the world that he sent his only son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but come to everlasting life. Why did the word become flesh and dwell among us? Redemption. We were in need of a savior. And so the savior, the eternal word, assumed a human nature and became like, it, one, like one of us in everything except sin. And then what did he do with that human nature? <clears throat> Certainly he, uh, he taught through that human nature. He ruled. He was a king, though not of an earthly kingdom. He ruled the word, the Son of God ruled through that human nature, taught through that human nature, right? They called him rabbi, teacher. But ultimately, he saved through that human nature. And that's the priesthood. We are all participants in the royal priesthood. Although the members of the royal priesthood, the laity, participating in that royal priesthood, you participate in it in a different way from ordained priest. Uh, the difference is not one of degree, but of essence. But it's still the one priesthood of Christ. What is the essence of the priesthood? To offer sacrifice and to be sacrificed. What is the essence of love? Sacrifice. Authentic love is tested love. 
Love that is not willing to pay a price is phony, hollow, empty, an imposter to the throne. When you're young, and perhaps not having acquired a great deal of wisdom yet, feelings often masquerade as love. I've often told this, the little illustration, the story, how sometimes it happens in my travels that the local priest will say, hey, will you talk to this young couple that I'm preparing for marriage? I, I, you know, they just don't get it. They're clueless. They're going to get married, and they don't know what marriage is, and they don't know what love is, and I don't think I'm getting through to them. Maybe somebody different, like you, <laughs> will work. I say, okay. So on the appointed night of the Pre-Cana conference, in comes the happy couple. And instead of the benign, smiling face of their parish priest, they are greeted at the door by me. <laughs> and they wonder what they've done. But I'm always nice. And I say, great, nice to meet you. So you're getting married. Yes? Wonderful. So you're in love. Oh, well, yeah, Father, that's what, yeah, that's why we're getting married. We're in love. L-U-V. I said, great, wonderful. Joey, what's love? Now, if he's from New York, like me, and if he's Italian, like me, he might say, yeah, father, we're in love. You know, love. <clears throat> we got feelings. Great, bozo. You got feelings. Feelings are up one day and down the next. <clears throat> like a yo-yo. Very soon the devil will be holding the string. You better have more than feelings. Now how about you, the blushing bride-to-be, Susie Q? What's love? Oh, Father, you know. We've got chemistry. <laughs> Honey, you better have more than that. That can blow up. <laughs> you know, they're in love. They're getting married. They don't know what love is. What is it? How about this? Love desires the highest and best thing for the sake of the beloved. They can never argue with that. That's a kind of uh, an irrefutable statement. Think about it. If you're in love, you desire the highest and best thing for the one you love. And then I, I might say, well, okay, what's that? Well, you know, Father, a nice house, Good. Job security? Good. Couple kids? Okay. Doggy name spot? Okay. You know, early retirement? Okay. You know, um, our profit sharing and pension plan intact when we check out of here? Especially if you work for Enron or Arthur Anderson? Good, very good. Okay, what else? Come on, Father, what else is there? Now, I'm talking to Catholics, experts on love, about to get married. What else could there be? And then I give them the punchline. How about heaven? If you love someone, you desire the highest and best thing for them, what is higher and better than eternal salvation? You think it doesn't exist? Oh, it exists. And it's not a done deal.
We haven't arrived. We're on the way. If I love you, and I do, I want you in heaven forever. And I will do anything and everything to get you there. I will not tell you what you want to hear if what you want to hear is something less than the truth. That's not love. That's indifference at best and cowardice at worst. I'm not going to confirm you in your sins and say you're okay, I'm okay, when you're living in sin, not if I love you. Parents can think the same way about your children. Children about your parents. Grandparents about your children and your grandchildren. See, the older you get, the bigger responsibilities you get. Pretty heavy burden. The burden of love. I can trace all of the world's ills to an unwillingness to sacrifice. All of the evils in the world can be traced back to an unwillingness to love, which equates with an unwillingness to sacrifice. We had uh, that beautiful renewal of the marriage vows a little while ago. And uh, remember the wording in that preface where I said, the, the, the prayer says, you know, over those many years, there have been difficulties, struggles, sacrifices, suffering, known only to you. No pain, no gain. No cross, no crown. No gall, no glory. That love which equates with hormones and feelings is for kids. It's not mature, it is not authentic, but it can grow into authentic love. There's nothing wrong with hormones, God put them there. There's nothing in itself wrong with that attraction, God put it there. But if that's all your concept of love is, it has to fail. If the only element of love in a couple's life is physical, I don't care how good looking you are. I don't care how good the sex is. It's going to get old. And you're going to go in opposite directions. Because love is a lot more than that. In the end, love is sacrifice. You have to learn how to sacrifice. We have become disenchanted with penance and with sacrifice. In earlier years in the church's history, we know that uh, the saints and other normal Catholics did pretty rigorous penance, fasted a lot more than we do today. You know, remember in the old days you couldn't eat for 12 hours before receiving Holy Communion? Remember that? And, um, you know, we, in general, you know, we didn't eat meat on Friday, <clears throat> although I have to admit that um, lobster thermidor is not exactly a penance for me. You know, black and red fish isn't so bad, you know, and not a big penance. But we used to do more penance. We were more attuned to sacrifice in years gone by. Why, there was a time even in the history, in the lives of the saints, you read about how they wore a hair shirt. Sometimes to do penance, it was uncomfortable. We don't do that anymore, and we don't have to, partly because... Your hair shirt might be sitting next to you. You might be married to your hair shirt. You might wake up every morning and turn and say, Good morning, hair shirt. I wonder how scratchy you're going to be today.
but it's not bad. It's just normal. Uh, and I mean, you know, some say, oh, that's a terrible thing to say, Father. It is, but it's true. You know how they polish gems? You know, emeralds, rubies, diamonds. You know, you, you can you can put them in a tumbler with grit, tumble them, and the grit shines them, it rubs off the dull, and they become brilliant. Rubs off the rough edges. That's what a family will do that has the right spirit. All of us are grit at one time or another. All of us are used by God to rub the rough edges off of others, especially the ones closest to us. I have often said, if you can win the battle at home, you've won. I don't have a problem so much with people out there. I got a problem right in my house. You know, you've got a problem right at home. If you can live with dad day in and day out, and you learn to be patient, you learn to accept his little idiosyncrasies, and he does the same for you. It's difficult some days. He may have a habit that drives you nuts. Every Lent, I find out all about it, because I hear confessions quite a bit. Mom might come in and say, bless me, Father, the no good son of a so-and-so did this, 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 and this. And I said, wait a second, whose sins are you confessing? <laughs> I was born on the feast day of St. Bernardino of Siena, a great Franciscan saint, preacher. And uh, St. Bernardino of Siena used to say, only those who are called to live it, understand the difficulties of community life. Now, living in community as a religious is kind of like living in a family. It is. Um, you're, you're in a closed environment, you know. You've got four walls enclosing you. And you've got to then live with your family, day in and day out, year after year after year. I was telling somebody a little bit earlier, I have a friend, I have a lot of friends, actually, who are Carmelite nuns, and this particular Carmelite nun was the daughter of a United States ambassador. Uh, he had been an ambassador, I believe, uh, to Bolivia. And he had been an ambassador to another country. And was, you know, she was from the upper echelon of um, society. And she had never been baptized. Didn't have any religion really growing up. And she was, a, she was at Vassar. You know, Vassar College, which was, of course, a, a very prestigious, in those days, women, women's school. Um, you had to be from a certain strata of society, really, to go to Vassar. And she was about 20, and um, she decided to take instructions for some reason in the Catholic Church, and then um, entered the church, was baptized, and I think, uh, I think the story, when she told me she had she used to see a Carmelite monastery, passed by it, on the bus or streetcar or something. And one day she had this clear understanding, well, you've started this Catholic thing, you might as well go all the way. And so she entered Carmel. And she said the day that she came to the monastery and she knew she was going to walk through that door and never come out. And she said, I, I walked into the parlor and the nuns were at the other side of the iron grate to greet me. And I looked in there, and I saw those 13 faces, and I thought to myself, oh my God, for the rest of my life I have to stare at those sour pusses. <laughs> they opened the door, and in she went. She's been professed 60-some years now. And she has uh, seen and experienced the heat of the day in the noonday sun as they say, as married people do. Over time, a spirit of loving sacrifice will rub off the rough edges, polish you, and make you shine with the luster of God's precious jewels. Uh, that is why marriage is a sanctifying 
thing. It's holy. The state in life is holy. And part of the reason is because you are called to live in sacrificial love day in and day out. And fidelity to that will make you great. It will help you to advance. It's not a small thing. And nowadays especially with all the attacks on the family, <clears throat> so many men and women and children suffer so much because of infidelities of all kinds at one time or another <clears throat> and sometimes it is justifiable and I understand it <clears throat> hard to put up with it day in and day out year in and year out so they separate get divorced okay I understand that my parents were divorced it happens it's unfortunate whenever it happens but invariably at one juncture or another one partner or the other doesn't want to love enough isn't willing to sacrifice enough isn't willing to take up their cross every day and walk with Jesus and so they quit before they reach the finish line and I sympathize with all of them but I feel sorry for all of them now I have never been married and I can assure you by the grace of God I never will be but the priesthood is like marriage in a way in a spiritual and an analogous way. Um, I remember a key moment, some of you heard me tell this story many times before, when I was a novice. When I came up one Sunday morning at the monastery where I was and I entered a place like this, you know, the ambo, the pulpit, and I was the lector that morning and there was a, f a full church of people. And I read the the reading, first reading, and then they sang the responsorial psalm and I was waiting to read the second reading. And there was a very beautiful girl in the front pew. And I was younger then. And she looked at me and I looked at her. And something connected. It wasn't bad. It was not an immoral and impure thing. Not at all. Very beautiful actually. And I knew in an instant that I'd never be married and I'd never have children. And a great sadness overtook me, penetrated my soul. And I never have a person to share my life with. Uh, when the, the couple renewed their vows, and I was reading that uh, introductory part, it came back to haunt me. How beautiful. How beautiful. Matrimony. How beautiful it is to have that gift that God gives you someone to spend your life with. To share everything. Wow. That's great. Now, I know there are times when it doesn't seem so great. It can be a real trial. A real penance, a real hair shirt. But you know, it, that, that sadness was instantly turned into joy because the Lord kind of spoke in my heart. Oh, I'll give you a, a bride, all right. I'll give you the most beautiful bride in the universe. My own beautiful, mystical bride, the church. You see, Jesus is the bridegroom in Scripture, and the church is his bride. And every priest is taken up in Christ, the high priest, the bridegroom, and espoused to the church. I'll give you a beautiful bride, and I'll give you children beyond counting. And I was confirmed absolutely in my vocation and never doubted it. From that moment to this, I was ordained by the Pope himself. 
I floated out of St. Peter's Basilica. For months, I woke up in the middle of the night, and from my very soul, a prayer of thanksgiving came up. I I'm a priest. I'm a priest. Thank God. Thank God I'm a priest. I remember telling people constantly, I have never lived until the day I was ordained, because I was born for this. And I was always like a disjointed bone until I became a priest. And the first few years of my priesthood were like the honeymoon. Ain't it grand? Hmm? And then the honeymoon's over, and you begin to f learn about sacrifice. You know, the first years, you wake up and there's the love of your life right next to you. What a great thing, and you're thankful. And then you begin to take it for granted after a while, and maybe love grows cold, indifferent. Anything can become mundane and old after a while, no matter how beautiful and great it is. And then the difficulties come. You begin to age, both of you. You were once a grand physical specimen. And now you look in the mirror and every once in a while you frighten yourself. As time went on, in my uh, priesthood, in, in my love for the church, um, kind of the newness, the honeymoon, you know, went away and the newness wore off. And you settle in for the long haul. Sickness, misunderstanding, arguments. You don't appreciate me. I work and I slave and you don't appreciate me. I fly almost 200,000 miles a year and have done so for 10 years or so. That's a lot of frequent flyer miles. I meet wonderful people like you, and that is a great blessing for me. Sometimes, no matter how good you do it, no matter how faithful you are, you can't please your bride or the groom. No matter how faithful the priest is sometimes, no matter how hard he works, very often he is not recognized. Now, I'm, I can't complain. I have it much, much better than the average priest. But the average priest, the average parish priest, works, I believe, much harder than I do. And he has much less recognition for his effort than I do. Uh, I pretty much have the love and recognition of the people wherever I go. I get thousands and thousands of letters, all positive. Every now and then there'll be a, a foul ball hit. And, you know, somebody will complain or say, I'm a no good blankety blank. Eh, that goes with the territory. That's okay. But for the most part, it's pretty easy. But along the way, there are critical junctures that require a greater outpouring of love, which equates to a greater outpouring of sacrifice. Instead of being self-centered, we have to be then more Christ-centered, more other-centered. In other words, you put God first, everybody else second, you last. 
And then ultimately a great promise is fulfilled. For the last shall be first. And your sacrifice is not unseen by the only one who matters. No one on this earth may appreciate you, but God does. He sees it all. Every slightest sacrifice, every act of love, every tear, every longing and aspiration of the heart, oh, God sees it all right. And he stores it up, treasure in heaven for you. I celebrated my 11th year of ordination this past May. It has been, the, in many respects, the worst year of my life. Uh, the most rigorous and demanding year of my life. I have had ten years of absolute, could we call it success in quotation marks? You know, I've gone from zero to top end and nothing flat. And then, in this year of catastrophe, this year of escalating crisis and disaster. September 11th comes and goes. Bury my dad, which I knew was coming and was okay. He was at peace and so was I. No problem. Then come the scandals. As if September 11th didn't rock this nation to its foundations, then a succession of scandals, financial scandals, accounting scandals, and then, lo and behold, church scandals, the priesthood, shaken to its foundations, a veritable tidal wave of scandal. Every day, it seemed to get worse. I felt like I was getting sicker with each passing day. And although it didn't directly affect me, it did. Because anything that affects a priest, any priest, affects the priesthood. For in a sense, I am my brother's keeper in a very, very much more intimate way with priests. When one of my brothers fails, I consider it a failure personally. Hundreds are now gone who last year at this time were still with us. Hundreds of priests at the worst possible moment, they're gone. Now, I understand that the poor bishops have to do something. There's a clamor for blood in the media. And I understand it. It is an outrage. It's a, it's a moral outrage. You, and you can't do this. The things that we read about and saw on television, uh, men who were guilty of these sins and these even crimes, you can't do that. You can't move them around one parish to the next. Now, in all fairness to the bishops, though, that's how everybody handled those kinds of things back then. You know, if Uncle Herbie was sexually abusing his niece or some other member of the family, Mom and Dad didn't call CNN. They didn't even go to the police or their attorney. It was handled quietly. That's just, I'm not saying that was the best way. That's just the way it was. If you had a bad cop, usually it was handled quietly. If you had a bad politician, usually it was handled quietly. If it was handled at all, and it probably wasn't handled in any of those cases. 
and the bishops just got caught in that way of doing things back then. Now it's different. It needs to be different, all right. And so some of these guys, they need to be removed, and they were, all right, necessary. They, they, they can't be in those situations. But what's happening is there's a crisis in the marriage. There's a crisis in the marriage between the priest and the church. There's a crisis going on in my own heart. Some of my dearest friends and brothers, as the headline says, are gone forever. And the word forever is the one that gets you. The last time they heard those words in a definitive way, they were told that they are a priest forever. Now they're gone forever. And it has a very unsettling and definitive ring to it. And I have to admit, I've been sick for weeks. And when that doctor told me, you've got to have immediate surgery, I was shocked but not surprised, and I thought, well, I'm that age. That's when it started for my dad. I have too much stress. I, I don't eat right. I don't exercise. I don't do anything right. No wonder, right? I got nobody to blame but myself. Well, it so happened that wasn't the case, but I'll tell you this. I'm happy. The other doctors found out it looks like my heart's okay. But I can tell you, my friends and my family, I am sick. I'm sick in my heart. I'm very sick. And I don't know if I'll ever get over it, this side of eternity. And I wonder what's next. With all we've seen in just one year, the last year, you just got to wonder, what's next? What else is going to happen? What other catastrophe is waiting to unfurl itself against humanity, against the church, against the country? And nothing will surprise us anymore. For you almost have to resign yourself to the reality that we have entered very unusual times. And so, yes, I am sick. And yes, there is a crisis in my marriage. There is a crisis in my espousal to my bride, the church. For the honeymoon is over. And we no longer look at each other in the same way, with the same longing, with the same emotion, with the same fire. And I am called to love more because of it. I am called to sacrifice more because of it. It no longer feels good. I am no longer infatuated with the beauty of my mystical bride. For I have seen the effects of time and sin, and I'm sick. And sometimes I just don't know how to go on. And it is at those times that I have to remember what you have to remember. Love equals sacrifice. And sacrifice equals love. Used to be a saying we had when I played football when I was in the army. When the going gets tough, the tough get going. 
I think the first time I ever heard it was from my football coach who had planted his size 12 shoe in my back end and exhorted me to play football, not like a girl. And I got the message, and I got going. And it hurt, because he expected you to go beyond your limits. He expected you to play when you were hurt. He was unreasonable, irrational. He demanded sacrifice. He demanded it. And by golly, he got it. Or you weren't there for very long. That's one way to learn it. But another way to learn it is the easy way. Through the lesson of Jesus. Look at a crucifix if you want to know about love. And remember that Without any question, it is the cross that is love. And in the end, love is the cross. I think my, my dad learned about love in the last few years of his life. I remember right after I was ordained, uh, dad gave me his car. You know, he had, a, he had a Jeep, and it had about 103,000 miles on it, but it was still a good car. And um, he gave me the car, and he said, I wish I could have been a better father. And I said, don't worry about it, Dad, I know. Said, don't worry about it. But God the Father heard his words and is accepted it like a prayer and my dad entered into a very special place called redemptive love he began to suffer more than 30 surgeries before he died and I know that it was my father's patient loving suffering that infused power into my priestly ministry. And not just him, there were many, many others. I have countless thousands of people that have prayed and suffered for my ministry, and that's why it is any good at all, not because of me. You see, it is not an individual effort, it's a collaborative effort. No one person can make a marriage, it takes two to tango. Uh, I, should, I could say three. It's husband, wife, and Jesus, right? You've heard that before. Well, I can't do it without you. And you can't do it without me. See, in a mystical way, you're the bride of Christ the church. And I am the bridegroom in him, and it takes two. You've got to pray for me, and I've got to pray for you. And when the going becomes very strained and difficult, it requires an escalation, an intensification, an increase of sacrificial love. I can tell you now that life in seclusion looks mighty good to me. I can tell you that I am this close to telling my superiors in a couple days, I'm out of here. Oh, I'll never leave the priesthood. But I don't want to have anything more to do with active ministry. In the last year, uh, I I've been traumatized watching what's going on in the church. I've been broken-hearted over some of my brothers who are no longer with us. You can't call them father anymore. The greatest preacher that I've ever heard in my life among the living preachers, Bishop Sheen might have been the greatest I ever heard on tape, 
But the greatest preacher I ever heard in person was a man who helped me and started me to preach. He's gone forever, and he's not dead. One offense, 25 years ago, never a recurrence. And he's treated in the same way uh, that a man who is a chronic pedophile is treated. No differentiation. They're all alike. Treat them all alike. Get rid of them. Okay. He's gone. And I am not happy at all. And I have a tendency to get mad at my bride. But God requires love. And love is sacrifice. And without it, there is no sanctification. In the end, when you come to the end of the line, you will be judged on one thing and on one thing alone. Love. In the end, when you walk your last step and speak your last word, when the last beat of your heart has reverberated, you will be judged on one thing. Love. And love equals sacrifice. Sacrifice equals love. My brothers and sisters, the Catholic family is indeed a garden of holiness. And it is a garden of holiness because it is a garden where love is begotten, exchanged, protected, and nurtured. And you must remember and you must live that truth which cries out full-throated and unsparingly, in the end, love is sacrifice. I am called to love you in good times and in bad. I am called to love you in sickness and in health. I am called to love you for better or for worse. And so too you are called to love me the same way. It is a marriage. We are a family. May God bless all of our marriages and all of our families. May we bear fruit, fruit that endures. And when we come to the end, may every one of us behold the countenance of God and hear those blessed words, well done my good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your master's house. God love you. God's ways are so far above our ways as the heavens are above the earth. The synthesis of the gospel is Jesus himself at the end, forever. You and I will be in heaven or hell. Period. All right. Are we re ready for the question and answers? Okay. Uh, no, keep them. Yeah, or maybe you can get some out for me. Or you can. Uh, Barb wanted me to say a few words about uh, a thing called call to action. Okay. I, I can't elaborate on it, go into great detail, but it stinks. That means that clear enough? Very clear. Because to the best of my knowledge, some of the things on their agenda uh, concern the ordination of women, which is a theological impossibility. So uh, somebody gave me a, uh, you know, those uh, insulated can holders that you put a can of pop in, or, and it says get over it on there. Uh, uh, that's what it is. The agenda of call to action is not good. It is, and I don't care who promotes it, it's not good. 
and it doesn't matter if a bishop or anybody else promotes it, it still stinks. So that's short and sweet. Okay. Another question here. My sister has been a lesbian for 30 years, and we love her, and we welcome her and her partner at family events. What should we do when she asks to stay at our home with her partner for the weekend so she can visit family in our state? Well, you know, that's a question that's certainly in the area of what we were talking about, family, you know, and how uh, that uh, important document says uh, every member of the family should be treated with dignity and love, uh, especially those who are in greater need. Okay? Especially those who are in greater need. So, how do you treat sis uh, who has that orientation in life, sexually? You, you got to treat her with dignity, with respect, as a person. She's a person. That The orientation doesn't change the underlying fact she's a person, a child of God. You've got to love her. You've got to treat her with respect and dignity. By the same token, you do not have to accept that lifestyle, nor can you. Nor can you affirm her in that particular lifestyle. Uh, it's a case of love the sinner, hate the sin. Now, there are mitigating circumstances very often. Maybe her sin uh, is not as bad as we think. There may be mitigating circumstances, psychological circumstances that we don't know about. And so you can't condemn a person when you don't know the whole story. So the bottom line is love her. Uh, can you let her stay at the house? You know, I tend to be a straightforward, uh, in-your-face, honest kind of a person. And if sis comes to my house uh, with her lesbian lover partner, I'll say welcome. Um, glad to see you. How are you? And I'll say, uh, you're welcome to stay tonight. You, you sleep there, and you will sleep over here. And there won't be no hanky-panky, because the boss of the house uh, will be up with his boss hat and his baseball bat. <laughs> that simple. Respect us in our beliefs, you know, and, and we love you. We strip back you, but, you know, that ain't no way under this roof. You know, we, we are welcome. You're welcome, and we love you, but you can't do it here. Okay. Can pedophiles be saved, and how? I'm not sure what you mean by saved. Uh, if you mean, um, you know, from the point of view of redemption, can they be saved, mean get to heaven? Certainly. Certainly. A anybody, you know, there's no unforgivable sin, okay? If somebody commits a sin, they have to repent. Firm purpose of amendment, you know, you're Catholic, you go to confession, and the sin's forgiven. So can they be saved in the redemptive sense? Of course, like any sinner can be saved. <clears throat> Certainly, pedophiles can. If you mean, however, can they be rehabilitated? You know, that, that's a, uh, a moot point, or maybe not so moot, uh, a lot of experts now are saying if it's chronic, long-standing, and they really are dyed-in-the-wool pedophiles. Now, a lot of these cases you're hearing about are not pedophilia. Most of them are not. They don't involve little children. They do not. There is a difference between someone who chronically and habitually sexually abuses children little children. There's a difference. I'm not saying either case is good. No. They're both bad, but there's a, a radical difference between somebody who does that and a person who, through a weakness, uh, had a fling with a 17-year-old person of whatever sex and isn't addicted to it, doesn't do it chronically. That's wrong. That's immoral. That shouldn't be done. But there's a tremendous difference between the two cases, and they can't be treated the same. And to do so is criminal, in my mind. To treat those two cases as they, though they were equal is criminal in itself. By the way, that is happening. In the case I mentioned, it happened to seven priests in one diocese who had one case 25 to 35 years ago, repented, and never had a repeat offense in all that time. That is very different 
from a person who chronically offends and who's molesting little children. That's, that's hor horrible. That, you, those people, you have a hard time to rehabilitate them. Uh, certainly God can forgive them if they have the right disposition. Uh, so can pedophiles be saved? Certainly in the redemptive sense, anybody can be saved. The only way a person is lost is by what's called that unforgivable sin, and that is final impenitence. The sin of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, like you see in the Bible, that means final impenitence. Is there any sin that cannot be forgiven? All sins can be forgiven. The only way you can't be forgiven is if you're not sorry. Final impenitence is the only unforgivable sin. Okay. Do you believe that the church will become stronger because of the present scandal? Yes, I do. Every time in the history of the church, when we were faced with a crisis, a heresy or whatever, the church became purified and strengthened. No question about it. Um, I think... Uh, when a bone breaks, you know, you, you break your leg or your arm, uh, if it heals properly, I think the place where the bone knits and heals, so they tell me that that can be stronger even than the rest of the bone. I don't know. I'm, I don't know. Is that true, doctor? <laughs> you don't know either. <laughs> I don't know, but I've heard that. I don't know. When a person is wounded in a certain way, uh, very often that very wound can make them stronger. The church suffers these things, yes. It'll purify and strengthen the church. Will it help or hinder vocations? Both. I got to be honest with you. I cannot, for any human reason, recommend a man to become a priest. Now, I can't. I'm sorry. If a young man comes to me, I cannot recommend the priesthood to him for any conceivable human reason. However, I can recommend it for all the divine reasons, which are the only right reasons anyway. And so if you don't come for absolute spiritual reasons, you shouldn't come. Why? It's too hard. It's just too hard. Now, there was a day, you know, when I was young, priests were very well respected, and you could have a pretty decent life as a priest. It wasn't bad. You worked hard, but you live in a rectory, you were taken care of, you had the love and respect of the people and society, no more. Now, you're going to be questioned and doubted at every turn. And so, for no human reason, but for the right reasons, spiritual reasons, yeah. Will it help or hinder vocation? It will hinder all the wrong candidates, and it will help all the right candidates. And so we'll end up with a better quality of priests in the end. Would you speak on the fast before communion? Well, that's not exactly about the, uh, the family, but it, I'll do it quick. Um, yes, it is still only water one hour before communion time. That's still the way it is, yeah. Could you please comment on moral relativism? How do you answer the pervasive belief that all religions are equally valid and that if you believe it to be okay, then it is okay for you. You want me to answer that in 30 words or less? It's a great question, by the way. Very good question. There is plenty of moral relativism. All religions are equally valid. No, they're not. God didn't found them all. God founded one. Jesus founded the church. Don't believe it? Read the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16. And upon this rock I will build my church. Who will build his church? Jesus. Who's Jesus? God. The divine institution of the church. Who's Peter? The Pope. What church is the Pope the head of? The Catholic Church. Are they all the same? Of course not. Do they all believe the same thing? No. Which one did God institute? The one you're in. The Catholic Church. Does it mean that, they're all, that all the rest of them are bad? No. All the rest of them have something good about them. All the rest of them have dimensions of the truth. All the rest of them have some power to save.
they have some means of salvation. And so there's some good in them. And I tend to try to accentuate the positive, not criticize them. I know plenty of real good Baptists and good Presbyterians and wonderful uh, Pentecostals. Wonderful people, great people. A lot of them are a lot better than a lot of us. But it's not because their religion is better. It's because they practice what they have better. And we who have the fullness of the means of salvation, we don't do much with it, many of us. And so they end up further ahead than we do. Why? Because they use what they have better than we do. So it's, no, they're not all the same. You know, that's syncretism. That's a heresy. It's okay for you to believe, if you believe it's, a, if, let's see, and that if you believe it to be okay, then it is okay for you. That is absurd right on the face of the statement. But they do, you're right, that's what they say. Uh, if you believe it's okay, then it's okay. If, if you think that uh, artificial contraception is okay for you, then it's okay for you. I mean, I might not think so. It might bother my conscience. Uh, therefore, it's bad for me, but good for you. Again, horse pucky. <laughs> and that's where you have, yes, moral relativism and no moral absolutes. And it's wrong. The truth is what it is, whatever I think it is or otherwise. It is what it is because that's what it is, not because I happen to think. Well, I give you a long dissertation on the downfall of philosophy. And start with René Descartes in the Cogito Ergo Sum. I think, therefore, I am. Hmm? Uh, all of philosophy before that basically said, this is a piece of paper. Why? Because I think so? No, because it is. But Descartes turned it upside down. He said, this is a piece of paper because I think so. Hmm? Uh, this is a microphone, whether I think so or not. You may think it's a pepperoni pizza. <laughs> is it a pepperoni pizza because you think so? Heck no, try to bite into it. <laughs> okay? So it, it is not okay just because you think it's okay, because I might think taking out an Uzi and blasting you all to kingdom come is the thing to do tonight for my parting celebration. <laughs> Boy, isn't it okay if I think it's okay? <laughs> you say, you're goofy. <laughs> and I say, you're right. All right. Father, <clears throat> how can we be disciples of Jesus in the world loving our brothers and sisters without turning them off by our preaching. Well, that's a tough one. You're right. Sometimes you've got to shut up. Most of the time you've got to shut up. That come as a revelation? Preach less and pray more. Preachy Christians drive more away than they attract. You've got to know when to hold them and when to fold them. <laughs> right? Every poker player knows that, and you better know it too. You've got to know when to talk and when to shut up, and there's more time when you shut up than when you talk, especially with people who aren't receptive. There is an axiom in metaphysics, and, and it's an axiom that carries through in theology. Things are received according to the mode of the receiver. That means a person is able to receive what they have capacity for. I'll give you an analogy. Uh, where I live in California, it's the biggest agricultural region uh, in the United States. Uh, it, it, I mean, the, the fields are flat and they stretch forever. You cannot see the end of the fields. When I drive home uh, from the airport in Sacramento and drive up to where I live, I will see rice fields that stretch further than the eye can see. Now, there is no rain in the state of California normally from about May to November. No rain. Now, you know, without water, you can't grow anything. You certainly can't grow rice without water, right? So what do they do? They irrigate, right? So you have 
a series of aqueducts, pipes, irrigation ditches, and it brings water from a source. The water flows, the stuff grows. The water doesn't flow, nothing grows. So you say you have a, a pipe, and it's a four-inch pipe, and under a certain amount of pressure, a certain amount of water is able to flow. Over time, sediment builds up in the pipe, and the pipe is now three inches, two inches, one inch, and finally, there's only a trickle coming through, and then there's nothing, because the pipe is clogged up. That pipe is only able to receive as much water as it's capable of. Same as you. You're only to, able to receive as much grace, as much truth, as much instruction as you are capable of. Now, the problem is, a lot of us have clogged pipes. Uh, one time I was preaching down in Florida, and I said, well, you've got to repent. You know, sin is what clogs the pipe, so to speak. Hardening of the attitudes. I'll send you up to my cardiologist. <laughs> He's sure to give you a triple bypass. <laughs> I was preaching down in Florida, and I'm talking about how you got to repent, how you got to get rid of the, the, uh, the sludge in your spiritual pipes. And a man leaped up in the back of the auditorium, and he began to shout out, Praise the Lord! Glory be to God! Thank you, Lord, for Father Karapi, the rotor rooter of my soul. <laughs> That's me, folks. <laughs> Things are received according to the disposition of the receiver. I can talk to a thousand people, and often do, or a million, or ten million, as I also often do through television. One message comes out of my mouth. A million people each receive it in a unique way, directly proportional to their disposition, kind of like a filter. Things pass through a filter, oil filter, water filter, air filter. The filter is the sum total of your education, your environmental conditioning, your culture, your upbringing, all those things comprise your filter. And then things come at you. And the problem is most people don't check their filter. And so the message comes through in different ways to different people. Preach less, pray more. Praying will remove the sediment. Praying will remove the spiritual debris, and it will enable them to receive the message. Pray more, preach less. It is very rare when we are called to talk. How do you know when you're called to talk? Somebody asks you to. <laughs> you know that relative that won't go to church? You know? Uh, how do you know you ought to give them a lecture or a sermon when they ask for one. When they come to you in pain and difficulty, and they will, believe you me, God will slap them upside the head, and they'll come to the religious one in the family. And then you can, you can read it. You can see they're suffering. You can see they're struggling. And then you help them. You give them the truth, but you do it in love, patiently. Patiently. You do not impose it on them. You do not use the truth like a bludgeon or a meat cleaver. Hmm? It, it depends on what they're ready for. Preach less, pray more. One nation under God. People, see, I, I kind of like questions and answers. So it, there's, I've been doing it from the beginning of my ministry. Next year, every single mission I do may be straight question and answer. I'm, I'll give the people several months to prepare. They'll make up the questions, and I'll come, and I'll do this for two days. Ask any question you want. I'm not afraid of enemy. And now they got a, a real brief one, and it's not even a question. Well, it is a question because it's got a question mark at the end. One nation under God. That's a statement, right? But it can be a question. One nation under God? Indeed. 
Indeed. Well, we say so, you know, but are we? You are what your actions prove you to be. As long as we are in fact one nation under God, we will believe in God. And if we believe in God, we will accept what God says. And if we accept what God says, we will do, we will act in accordance with what God says. One nation under God indeed, but there is a big gap between what we say and what we do. Not just in the nation, but also in the church. The last several popes have said there is an enormous gap between what we profess and what we live. And our job is to narrow the gap, to start living what we profess. Why at Mass, after communion, do the priest sit and a lay person puts the body of Christ in the tabernacle and sometimes they sit before the tabernacle is closed? Is this right? What do we do? Well, you don't do anything. <clears throat> because in the first place, nobody made you pope yet. <laughs> or even bishop. So you don't have to feel you've got to do something about every little thing. Now, I thought it was going to say, why do priests sit and lay persons distribute communion? And then I was going to say, well, they shouldn't. It's okay to have extraordinary ministers of the Eucharist who are lay people. That's okay. You know, well, we need them sometimes. But a priest should never sit while lay people distribute com communion. The ordinary minister of the Eucharist is the bishop, priest, or deacon. Okay? But maybe you only have one priest and a thousand people. So you've got some lay ministers. Fine, fine. And, and so the priest then, at the end... Uh, they finished distributing communion. He, the priest has done his job. He helped. He did distribute communion. Then he may bring the uh, saboria back to the altar or the credence table on the side and um, an instituted acolyte or a deacon or even an extraordinary minister of the Eucharist may purify the vessels and repose the blessed sacrament. Uh, is that possible? Yes. Yeah, uh, who, who says so? The pastor? Does he have discretion to permit that? Yes, he does. You know, ordinarily the, the priest will do it, but um, whenever I have a deacon, I let the deacon do everything he's able to. That's called the principle of subsidiarity. That's, that's what it is in, in, in theology. Everyone, in other words... There are certain things only a priest can do. Okay? And so the priest should do those things. A deacon can't hear confessions. Well, the priest hears confessions, okay? But a deacon can read the gospel. Well, should the priest say, no, I'm reading the gospel? I, if you can do it, do it. The principle of subsidiarity. So a person who's able to do a certain function uh, that's lower in the hierarchy should do it. Okay? The, the days when the priest did everything, that is, was not necessarily good. It was not necessarily the best way. And it was not the way it was done from the beginning of the church. Uh, but that, by the same token, I am not saying that lay people should try to begin to usurp duties that are proper to the priest. No, no, not at all. The priest is the priest, and he should do his duty. And the deacon his, and the lay people can do theirs. Can a lay person read the first reading? Of course. And, and the response? Yeah. And the second reading? Sure. Can a deacon read the gospel? Yes. Can the deacon even preach? Yes, he can. Well, who makes the decision? The pastor makes the decision. And the, bis the bishop in the diocese decides if they can do this, that, or the other thing. And then we But that, that's okay. I wouldn't worry too much about that one. You've only mentioned artificial contraception. What about sterilization? Yes, yeah, right, good point. Yes, of course, that is intrinsically evil as well. Now, it does not, see, I don't have time to go into a lot of detail, like with the principle of double effect. You know, it's possible that a certain medical procedure could result in sterilization, but that is not the intended effect. That's a secondary effect that comes about as the result of a certain procedure, medical procedure. Uh, a woman could have a 
spontaneously induced abortion as a secondary effect of some other medical procedure. The intended effect was not abortion. An unintended and secondary effect of the procedure resulted in an unintended, spontaneous abortion. That is not intrinsically evil. That was not intended. That was not what, what you tried to do. And so you can't equate the two. Sometimes women have or, uh, birth control pills prescribed to them, but not for the purpose of contraception. And is it okay? Is that permissible? Yes, of course. Of course. Because they're not taking them to prevent conception. They're taking them for some other medical reason, and, and sometimes that is permissible. Okay. Where did Bob go with all those questions? I'm doing good here. I'm almost out of them. Bring the box, Bob. How do we teach our young people to have a proper regard for the sanctity of the family when all of society, including their own parents, teach them the contrary? Oh, boy. That's a great question. Very insightful. And it's, it's hard. I would say it's almost impossible, but all things are possible with God. The parents, the ones that have them at home, St. Thomas Aquinas again said, an error in the beginning is an error indeed. You want to get them from the womb, okay? And now, if I were um, younger, and I hadn't become a priest, and I got married, let's say, and I'm in my 20s, and my wife and I uh, conceive a child. And we find out about, great, you know, we have a month-old baby inside mom. I would immediately begin forming the child. And I want to tell you, and you better believe it, that that child begins to be formed in the womb is capable of a certain level of receptivity, of external stimuli, can sense love, can sense trauma, can sense rejection, can sense evil, can sense the sacred. In a mysterious way, not a sense-perceptible way necessarily, but a mysterious way. Mom, I go to the sacraments as often as I could. I would pray, I would exercise virtue, I'd eat well, I'd get enough sleep, I'd do what the doctor told me, I wouldn't smoke, I wouldn't drink, I wouldn't do all those things that are harmful for the baby. You have now minimized your chances for an error in the beginning, which is an error indeed. Do not battle it out with dad in front of the child. But the child hasn't been born yet. The child is there. Go to church. Receive Jesus in Holy Communion. Hmm? Guess who gets a share of that? Baby. Not even old enough to receive First Communion yet. Wow, isn't that a mystery? That's a good start. That's what that is. And then the baby's born. Born into what? born into a house of love, a house of purity, a house of virtue, a house of temperance and continence, a good house, a Christian house, a Catholic house, a garden of holiness. Hmm? How can you possibly preserve your children from the contamination of a contaminated world? Precisely that way. Unfortunately, most of us don't wake up until we're older. And a lot of damage has already been done, but don't panic. Just start doing everything right. But hey, you know, we didn't wake up till Junior was 14, and now he's incorrigible. We can't do a thing with him. He won't go to church. What do you expect? What do you expect? He didn't have a good start. And now you've become serious all of a sudden about your faith. Now you're holy overnight. And Junior just doesn't understand it. Of course he doesn't. Now you've got to be patient. 
you know? The longer you wait, the harder it is. I have two Chesapeake Bay Retrievers, hunting dogs. One of them's two years old and the other one is a year old. Now if I waited until those dogs were five or six years old and began to give them obedience training and, and hunting training, it'd be too late. They just wouldn't be responsive. You know, you get old and set in your ways, and when you say sit, they look at you. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Down. Yeah. Come. Go. In your wildest dreams, buddy. Forget it. Too late. No, I started when they're eight weeks old. You know, a, a dog, we know from research, uh, the mo the re you've got to start with the eight, 49 days old. I'm giving you dog training class now, see? 49 days is the optimal age to get a dog, around eight weeks. That's when they usually, the breeders usually part with them, eight weeks. I got mine both when they're eight weeks old. And you begin immediately, in a gentle way, but you begin to f form them, to condition them, to train them. Uh, by the time my dogs are four months old, they retrieve on land and water. They come when I say come, they sit. When I say sit, they lay down when I say down. And when I say stay, they do. And you say, oh, I bet they're unhappy. And I say, oh, no, they're very happy. <laughs> Why? Because they want to please me. But if they were off on their own doing whatever they please, very quickly one of them run off, get hit by a car. And that's the lesson in dog training for this evening. <laughs> what can couples who were disobedient and sterilized do? We're both 50 and confessed our sins long ago. Uh, that's a very frequent question that I get, and a good one. If you were 25 or 30, the answer would be one thing. But you made a very clear question here. We're near 50. Well, nothing. What you can do, you've already done. You repented. You have a firm purpose of amendment. You live your life now in accordance with God's wishes. Be at peace. Be at peace. Don't worry. What's done is done. You know, you say, yeah, but I, I feel like I, I have to do something else. Well, you know, uh, pray for younger people that they will have the wisdom that you have now. Uh, dedicate one evening a week to praying together that young couples will know what you know now, but be at peace. Okay. Well, these are all, uh, they're, 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 t they're to the topic. I, I guess I can't uh, get out of it. <laughs> all right. <clears throat> Is oral sex and masturbation wrong with married couples? Is it considered a form of artificial contraception? Okay, well, that's a good question. I've been asked that question at least 8,000 times. And it warrants an answer. The norm is... Any form of what you might call foreplay uh, can be permissible if oriented towards natural intercourse, consummation of the marital act. If it is not an act unto itself, if it is not an act that cuts you off from the intercommunion with the other, if it is not in fact a form of, quote, masturbation, if it is that, then no. Uh, it is not wrong. If it is a part of lovemaking that moves towards natural consummation of the marital act, uh, then it is not necessarily wrong. But in and of itself and just for itself, mm -mm. nope. It can be a form of artificial contraception. Yeah, it could be. And you can't use it for that. No. But if it's, you know, part of the overall package, so to speak, and moves towards natural consummation intercourse, okie dokie. <laughs> you see, I fear no question.
<laughs> here's, a, here's a great one. You're, whoever you are, a person after my own heart. Explain that if sex is a gift to a teen whose hormones say, I have to share my gift. <laughs> Yeah, you think you can get me with this, don't you? That's like the kid who came to me one time and he'd read the Bible and he said, Hey, Father, it says right here in the Book of Wisdom, God has not created death and God did not create any bad plant and that means I can smoke some dope. <laughs> well, happy day if none of it's evil. If God didn't create any harmful plant, Everything has a purpose. Did God create the marijuana plant? You bet. Did God create the coca plant? You bet. Uh, is there a legitimate use for that? Yeah. Yeah, it's not for going up your nose. But <laughs> they used to use cocaine for very delicate eye surgery before they had a better synthetic drug. Uh, cocaine had a very, very useful purpose at one point in time. Now, I'm, you know, uh, the opium poppy, right? Uh, I mean, they, when, when, when they were getting ready to wheel me into surgery, uh, I know they had the, uh, the Demerol or the morphine drip ready. Well, where does the morphine come from? The opium poppy, you know, it's refined and, and, and processed a certain way. I, is that a legitimate use? You bet it is. Relieving pain under certain circumstances? Yeah. So how do you say, look, sex is a gift? Of course it's a gift. It is a gift, as I said, when used in the context of marriage. It's a great gift. But used outside that context, it's a curse. It's a curse. Inside the proper context, gift. Outside, curse. One begets life, the other begets death. Gunpowder was a useful invention. But if you swallow a couple barrels of it, it might have a harmful effect on you, especially if somebody lights a match. <laughs> yeah, it's a gift, but you got to use it as it was intended. Are there any prophets alive today? Well, you know, all the prophets, you know who the last prophet was, narrowly speaking? Yeah, um, John the Baptist, who was my patron saint. The bridge between the Old Testament and the New. Uh, the ma ma you have what's called the major and minor prophets in the Old Testament. Now you can look in the Bible and you can see who they were. Okay, that's the prophet in the narrow sense. Jesus is the consummation of all the prophets and all prophecy. Now you say, are there any prophets alive today? Yeah, lots of them. Lots of them. A prophet is made present by one who makes present Jesus, the consummation of all prophecy and all the prophets. When someone speaks in a prophetic spirit, it is not so much that they tell the future as so much as they have spent time with God, in, in, been infused with the mind and will of God, and then gone out and boldly and accurately told forth the mind and will of God. That's what a prophet does. I believe Archbishop Fulton Sheen was a prophet in his time. I believe Pope Paul VI, in writing Humane Vitae, was very much a prophet in his time. How were the prophets treated? Hmm? Uh, John the Baptist 
lost his head. The price of a dance. What happens now, today? Same thing. It is not politically correct to utter the prophetic message of Christ. And it is apt to one day cost me and others our head, so to speak. Hmm? So, yes, there are, there are not the prophets in the narrow sense. They stop with John the Baptist, consummated in Jesus. But there have been many. All the saints, in one way or another, have been prophets in their own way and in their own time. What state were you in when you found out you had to have surgery? Uh, we love you. Well, I was in California, the land of fruits and nuts, <laughs> the land of every goofy, wild, idiotic, nonsensical thing. And if you don't believe me, then hearken back a few weeks to the latest brilliant decision of the Ninth Circuit, who declared what? That the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag is unconstitutional. How brilliant. How brilliant. That's San Francisco. That's, that's the Ninth Judicial, Federal Judicial District. Wow. Wow. Goofy. Goofy. I was in California. Then I went to, of all places, Las Vegas to have the surgery. Why? I know people there. My, some, my best, one of my best friends is there. His fiance, fiance is a very experienced, 25 years worth of experience as a uh, critical care registered nurse in the cardiac unit, cardiac ICU. And she knows every surgeon and every doctor in the state of Nevada. And, and especially the heart one, the, the heart doctors, the cardiologist, the cardiovascular surgeon. And, and she was in a position to do everything. And you said, look, you finish, I'll take you home, and I'll take care of you for another week or whatever it takes so that you're fully recovered, then you can go home. So I was in California when I got, you know, the distressing report, and then I went to Nevada next door to get it straightened out. And as the folks in Nevada say, constantly say, you see, we're, we're better than California. <laughs> what can you say to people who continually do not practice what they preach? I can say, practice what you preach. <laughs> what do you want me to say? <laughs> right? That's what I can say. Why does your calendar events, of events end in October? It doesn't. It doesn't. But I've got nine events, maybe ten, I know I think nine, from August to the end of October I have nine events in a row. In November I think I have one or two, and I, think, I don't know if I have any in December this year. I don't plan it that way, uh, just that's the way it you know, that's the way it happened this year. Some years it's not like that, though. So I, I don't plan it that way, but that's just the way it happened to turn out this year. What can the mother do to ensure the salvation of her children and, great, and, and grandchildren? Besides saying the rosary. Say the rosary again. <laughs> and again. And again. Go to Mass. Do some penance. And most of all, trust God. Have childlike confidence in the goodness and mercy of God. And the more you trust, the more you enable God to work. That's a strange-sounding statement. But you can ask St. Therese, the 33rd doctor of the church, all about it. In her doctrine called the Little Way. Childlike confidence in God. Trust. Jesus, I trust in you. Immaculate Heart of Mary, I trust in you. Not much preaching. Lots of praying. That's what you can do for the salvation of your children and your grandchildren. What does IHS on, Eucharist, on the Eucharist mean? It's on a T-shirt. Gee, you know, people always ask me those things, and they're easy. And I should remember, and one of you will correct me. Somebody asked me that at a conference not too long ago, and I didn't get it. 
you know, it, it, I get it confused with I-N-R-I. You see that, that at the top of the cross? And that was Jesus Christ the Nazarene. You know, that's what Pilate had, had placed, you know, Jesus the Nazarene, King of the Jews, on top of the cross. And IHS, what is that? I don't, I, I don't, yeah. Of Jesus' name. There you go. Okay. First three letters in Hebrew of Jesus' name. Okay. I should know that, but I forgot. See that? I'm honest, too. <laughs> Here's a very short question. Harry Potter, question mark. I don't know much about Harry. <laughs> I've never met him. I think it, it, it has to do, there's a lot of uh, reference to the occult, right? I mean, Harry Potter, you know, witches and warlocks and magic and so forth. Uh, when, you know, there's always a potential for abuse when you get into that area, like Dungeons and Dragons, right? You know that. Now that resulted in many cases of people going further with the occult. It doesn't have to necessarily, and Harry Potter doesn't necessarily have to result in someone being drawn into the occult. It is not necessarily evil in and of itself. It's not something intrinsically evil. It's just a, a story. It can be entertaining. However, because it deals with what it deals with uh, in a fictional kind of a way, there is a potential there that someone can be drawn in deeper into the occult, and that is bad. That is not good. So I guess the bottom line is you've got to have your eyes open. You know, be astute. And as parents, know what's going on. You know, what are, what are the kids up to? And, and you've got to spend time with your kids, talk with your kids, and, and know what's going on in their life and watch for external manifestations of things. You know, they say that about drug use, you know. You know, you see changes in behavior, the way they dress, the way they act or talk. You know, you've got to be involved. You've got to be astute. You've got to be engaged parents, okay? Not, not paranoid parents, but you've got to be engaged. You've got to be involved in your children's life. What can we do for our grown children who were not raised Catholic? I converted after my son was an adult. We pray and we pray. How do we use this new knowledge of what we should have done when raising him now that he's grown and living a godless life? How do we help our family now? Spiritually. Spiritually. Your knowledge is power. Your knowledge is power, and your family is always your family. And you have the strongest voice before God for the members of your family. So you pray. It, it always comes back to that, doesn't it? You probably get sick of hearing me say the same old stuff. But that's, that's the truth. Pray. Pray the rosary. Go to Mass. Pray, pray, pray. And through you, they will receive graces. And mysteriously, one day they will begin to change. The change may come through adversity, and they will begin to be more receptive. And lo and behold, one day they'll say, you know, I'd like to come into the church. What do I do? That'll be a happy day for you. Believe that that can happen. Trust. It'll happen. If a Catholic dies in mortal sin, are they automatically sent to hell? Or will final repentance save them? Okay. Well, look, there's a difference. If you die in mortal sin, you didn't have final repentance. If you repent, you have final repentance. You repent before you die. Of course you don't go to hell because you didn't choose to. God does not ship people to hell. That's a misconception. God doesn't send people to hell. People choose to go to hell. And anyone, even if they had a... I remember, some of you remember I talked about how I baptized a mafia guy one time, a, a mafia boss, a major, major boss in the mafia. I mean, if I mentioned his name, you'd know it. Major, major crime family in New York. 
he had committed every sin in the book, as he said, including murder many times over. But as he got towards the end, uh, he probably had some old Italian grandmother that prayed for him, and he wanted to repent. He wanted to be baptized. He probably had been, but he didn't have any record of it, so I gave him conditional baptism. But I know he was repentant. He had final penitence. He was not impenitent. He was penitent. He was sorry for his sins. Will he go to hell? No. Of course not. He'll go to, eventually he'll go to heaven. He may spend, um, you know, quite a while in purgatory, expiating for his sin, being purified, but that's good. Pure, uh, purgatory, by the way, is a great blessing because if there's no purgatory, then you better be perfect when you check out because only the perfect stand before God. And if there isn't any purgatory and you're not perfect, there's only one place left, hell. So you better believe in, that there's a purgatory. And there is, lucky, lucky for us. Father, what do you know about Tom Rokoski from Pennsylvania? He built an underground church in the shape of a cross. I don't know anything about that. No, don't know him. Don't know a thing about that particular thing, sorry. Someone was saying, if you wait to have your child baptized, it was a mortal sin, now, say six months, and that you have to do it in the first six weeks. I agree that sooner the, be the sooner the better, but when is it a mortal sin? Well, I don't know, and no, neither does anybody else. That, that, that's not written in a theology book, okay? You have to remember that a mortal sin has three constituent parts, and they have to be in place simultaneously in order for it to be a mortal sin subjectively imputed. A grave matter, knowledge, and full consent of the will in the light of that norm. The, the answer is I don't know. I don't know the circumstances. What is the norm? The norm is the baby is born, and you get him baptized as soon as possible. You make the arrangements before he's born. Because you know he's going to be born in the next month or two. You go to the parish, you tell the priest, and you have him baptized. I was baptized when I was 10 days old. That's pretty good, pretty good shot, you know. Go for that. Uh, don't wait six months. Why? Something could happen, right? The child could get sick and die, and then uh, you're going to be miserable for the rest of your life. But I can't answer the question, nor can the Pope, because he doesn't know, because there isn't an absolute answer. The answer is, look, you're a Catholic, you're practicing as soon as possible, okay? When it's safe, when the baby's out of the hot, you know, you take them home, which is pretty fast, I guess. You can have them baptized. It's not a traumatic experience. You know, a little water, poof, nothing to it, you know? Do it. Don't wait, please. God bless you. God love you. And goodbye. <laughs>